Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa. Buddhang Dhammang Sanggang Namasami. Yes, so welcome to session two of the foremost series of all. Today, as mentioned, we are talking about the list of foremost nuns. And I am going to share my screen and then we will dive right in. So you should be able to see the um, overview for today now. Um, today we're talking, as mentioned, about the list of foremost theories. So foremost theories means that a particular nun had a special quality in which she was very excellent. And so the Buddha um, mentioned her especially and assigned that particular quality to her. So for example, for Kema, we know that she was the foremost in wisdom, or for Upalavana, we know that she was the foremost in psychic powers. And so there are many other nuns who were assigned those foremost qualities, and um, um, people compiled lists of those nuns. And the most famous list, um, I think the one that probably most people will be familiar with, is the one in the Angotra Nikaya of the Pali tradition. And that list has 13 nuns on it. And that list has parallels in the Chinese tradition. And um, those parallels are extremely fascinating. The um, first one is in the Akotara Agama in the in a Chinese translation. And that list has 51 nuns on it. So it's much, much longer than the Pali. And it includes many more nuns. And also the range of qualities that are included are vastly more diverse than the Pali one. So I think it gives a very beautiful overview over all the kinds of practices that nuns did in the early times. And actually I came across that list only a few months ago and when I found it, I was so inspired. Um, so um, I think that was actually the time when I, when I got the idea to have this kind of course uh, about the foremost theories of old when I saw this list. And uh, somebody else is coming in. And then there is a second parallel, which is called T126. It is also in Chinese. And that one isn't included in any of the Agamas or Nikayas. That one is an individual sutra preserved outside of the big collections. And uh, that one has 15 nuns on the list. And so one, would, one could think it's uh, quite similar to the Pali because the Pali has 13, that one has 15. Um, but actually we will see that they are very, very different, these two lists. So it would be very interesting to compare. And um, apart from these three lists, we also have Apadana literature. And when a theory is assigned this um, a foremost quality, then Usually in her Apadana story, she explains how she practiced and uh, what kind of attainments she had and then how the Buddha assigned that foremost quality to her. So in every Apadana story, usually if the nun has a foremost quality, it will be mentioned. But interestingly, we have a few Apadana stories where nuns are assigned foremost qualities and those nuns and those qualities aren't actually found on any of the lists that we have. So outside of this list, we still have a few more nuns um, that we only know from the upper Dana literature that they have those foremost qualities. So today we're going to look at the Avadana Sataka, which is a Sanskrit upper Dana text, and the Kama Sataka, which is a text that is only preserved in Tibetan. And we'll encounter a few more nuns, five more nuns there that are not found on any list. And then we know that um, Buddhist throughout the millennia have liked um, to compile lists about foremost monks and nuns and lay people. 
So we also have somewhat more modern lists. And when I say more modern, that doesn't mean that they're from modern times. They're still probably quite ancient, but they are newer than the commentarial tradition. So we know the famous Pali commentaries were written roughly a thousand years after the Buddha. So those lists are more modern than the commentaries, um, but still not, not like very modern. Um, so one list that um, I recently um, was introduced to is from the Khmer tradition in Cambodia. And it was Ayatata Loka and Dr. Uch who um, showed me that list. And that's a very fascinating list because it's closely related to the Pali tradition. I mean, it's obviously based on the Pali tradition and it has 50 nuns. So it's vastly longer than the list we have in the Angutra Nikaya. And it includes um, nuns from all the various uh, historical strata of texts. So it includes nuns from the Angutra Nikaya list and from the Tirigata, but also um, from the Vinaya and from Apadanas and from commentaries. So it's a very fascinating mixture of, um, of nuns that we find there. Um, so if there's time, we will also have a, a brief look at that list. And the first one we are going to have a look at today is the Angotra Nikaya list, the well-known list. Um, this is Pantasujata's translation. And it begins as follows. So the foremost of my nun disciples in seniority is Mahapajapati Gautami. Um, ah, before I go through the entire list, I, I should mention that the next 10 sessions of our course, we will focus on specific nuns. So each session has one specific nun. And those, because we have special sessions for all those nuns, I'm not going to talk about them today. I'm going to skip over them and only talk about the nuns that will not reappear anymore in our course. So we, next week will be about Mahapajapati Gotami. So I'm not going to say much about her today. Um, so I hope you won't be disappointed and you'll just uh, be patient and wait until next week. Um, so Mahapajapati Gotami is always uh, the first one on any list that I have seen. Um, because she is uh, supposedly the founder of the Bhikkhuni Sangha. There's a the very famous story about um, how she asked the Buddha to found uh, the Bhikkhuni Sangha. Um, whether or not that is historically accurate is something that we will explore next week. But um, definitely that, that is um, what the tra tradition says, and that's why she is in the first place in all of the lists. And then she's followed uh, by. Hema and Upalavana with, her two, with their two qualities, wisdom and psychic powers. And of course, Kema and Upalavana are the two female chief disciples of the Buddha. So they are the female counterparts to Sariputta and Mahamogalana. Um, so when people say the Buddha had two chief disciples, that's actually incorrect. The Buddha had four chief disciples, two male and two female. Um, so Sariputta Mahamogalana Kema and Upalavana. But we have separate courses, separate sessions on them. So we're going to skip over them. And then the one who has memorized the text on monastic training is Patachara. So Patachara is the foremost in Vinaya. Um, we also have a session on her. And then those who speak on the teaching is Dhammadinna. So Dhammadina, of course, is very famous because we have one of her suttas preserved. She is one of the very few nuns whose teachings have been preserved by the tradition. Um, and her um, sutra is the Tula Vedala Sutta Majjhima Nikaya 44. And it is still a highly valued um, teaching and very often taught until today. And so Damadina is one of the examples that we can um, cite when people say, oh, the early nuns were uneducated and they weren't able to teach. And that's why uh, we don't have any teachings preserved of the early nuns. It's because they didn't give any teachings. But actually, when we look deeper, there are so many nuns who gave teachings. Um, in the Pali tradition, we have Damadina, we have Kajangala, we have Sukha, we have Kema, uh, we have so many others. And when we look at the Chinese list in a few minutes, we will see there's so many other nuns also um, teaching. 
So that's something, that's a myth that is um, very clearly debunked. And uh, the next one of those who practice absorption, that is Jhana, is Nanda. So Nanda is the Buddha's half sister. She um, actually, according to her commentarial story and to her Apadana story, she didn't want to go forth at first. She only went forth because her entire family went forth, Mahapajapati and her brother Nanda and Rahula and many others. And because she wanted to be with her family, she went forth. So she actually went forth to have a family life. Um, but of course the Buddha then um, taught her the Dhamma and she eventually attained Arahanship and she also uh, attained this foremost quality in jhana practice. And Nanda is a very interesting character because um, she's often kind of mixed up with uh, her brother Nanda's fiance. So her brother Nanda, the Buddha's half brother Nanda, male Nanda, he was actually engaged to, me, to be married. And on the day of his marriage, of his wedding, the Buddha snatched him away and ordained him. And uh, his fiance is um, called Janapada Kalyani. And interestingly, Nanda's um, kind of nickname in the Apadana stories is also Janapada Kalyani. And it's very clear that in some of the texts, she and that other woman, the fiance, are kind of mixed up and they're not properly kept separate. So there's also something very interesting going on here with this Nanda and uh, her brother Nanda's fiance. But we're not having a, a session on her. So we are not going to explore that in more detail in this course. And the next nun, uh, foremost of those who are energetic is Sona. And Sona is very special because she is conceptualized very differently in the Pali tradition and in the Chinese tradition. So in the Pali tradition, she has this backstory where she's very, she's elderly. She had 10 children and uh, the children asked her to pass on the inheritance, which she did. And of course the children promised her to look after her and to provide everything for her. But when they got the money, all the 10 children kicked her out of their houses and she had no place to go. And so she went to the monastery and got ordained. And all the other nuns kind of looked down on her because they knew that she wasn't there for the proper reasons. Like she didn't have a spiritual vocation. She only needed a place to stay and some food. And so after a while, Sona felt really bad because um, she also uh, thought that she actually should practice the Dhamma. And so she made a huge effort and got fully enlightened. And that's why she got this quality assigned for being very energetic. And in the Chinese tradition, her character is very different. And we are going to see that when we come to the Chinese list. And the next one, the one with clairvoyance is Sakula. So she has the third eye or the divine eye. And she can see devas and can see things that happen far away. And the next one, the one with swift insight is Bada Kundalakesa. Bada Kundalakesa is an in extremely interesting nun. And we are going to have a session on her. And then next one is those who recollect past lives is Bata Kapilani. And Bata Kapilani, we're also having a session on her. She is Maha Kasapa's wife or ex-wife. And as we have seen last time, Maha Kasapa is portrayed by the tradition to have been extremely um, misogynistic, very much against Bikunis, very much against the female Sangha but he has a, a wife who is actually a bhikkhuni. So that's a very interesting constellation. And also Bata Kapilani is um, portrayed very differently in various Chinese texts um, as compared to the Pali. So that is something that will be a very interesting session to explore Bata Kapilani. And then foremost of those who have attained great insight is Bata Kachana. And Bada Kachana is interesting because her name does not reappear anywhere else in the early strata of the Pali text. Um, and she is associate of, associated often or usually by the tradition 
with Yasodara, Rahulamata, so the Buddha's ex-wife. And Yasodara, Rahulamata also is never mentioned at all in the early texts of Buddhism. She only appears in later literature. Um, and also compared, uh, the Pali tradition compared to the Chinese traditions, we see that uh, she's also fairly, her character is also fairly different. So um, she is really not a very well-defined personality. And we are going to have a session on Yasodara where we are going, where we're going to explore this in a lot more detail. Oops. And um, foremost of those who wear coarse robes is Tisa Gotami. Uh, Tisa Gotami also has a very dramatic life story um, and she's practicing an ascetic practice here, wearing coarse robes. And this is the only ascetic practice that is mentioned in the Pali list. But we are having a session on the nuns who are practicing ascetic practices. So then we are talking about uh, Kisa Gotami more. And then those who are strong in faith is Singalaka Mata. Uh, the, that is the mother of Singalaka. And Singalaka is a fairly famous person in the Theravada tradition because there is a long sutta in the Diga Nikaya called the Singalaka Sutta or Sigalovada Sutta, which is Diga Nikaya 31. And it's often called the Householder Vinaya because there the Buddha gives a very long, very detailed discourse to Sigalaka how to have a successful and happy and prosperous and virtuous life as a householder um, with a lot of detail. And that's why the Sigalaka Sutta is famous. And so Sigalaka Mata is the mother of this um, Sigalaka. And that was the Pali list. And we are moving on to the Chinese. This is Panta Analu's translation from the Ekotara Agama. So among my ordained disciples, the foremost of those nuns who have gone forth to train for a long time and are thus respected by the king of the country is the nun called Mahapajapati Gotami. So again, we see Mahapajapati in uh, the first uh, place the first mention, followed by Kema and Upalavana for their respective qualities, wisdom and uh, supernormal powers. And then we see um, number four is of those who undertake ascetic practices, the 11 restraints is the nun called Kisa Gotami. So we just now in the Pali, we saw Kisa Gotami uh, as the foremost of those who wear coarse robes. So in the Pali, she is doing one ascetic practice, here in the Chinese, she is doing all of them. And the Chinese mentions 11 restraints. So it seems that they had, at, at that point in time, they had 11 ascetic practices. In the Pali later tradition, we have 13 ascetic practices. And in the early text, uh, we don't have a clear number. It's just a cluster of ascetic practices, but they're not uh, yet, uh, elaborated and defined uh, to the same degree as um, they have the, as they then were later on in the later tradition. So we are going to explore more about aesthetic practices in one of our sessions. So I'm moving on. Um, of those possessing the divine eye, having supremely unobstructed vision is the nun called Sakula. So that's exactly the same as in the Pali. And Sakula has a small part of a discourse in the Ekatara Agama where uh, she displays this quality of having the divine eye and the Buddha actually praises her in front of the monks and says that he doesn't have any other disciple who is uh, as capable uh, or as skilled in the divine eye as Sakula. So the Buddha actually places her even above the monks who have the divine eye. So that's um, kind of special. Um, so um, the foremost of those who sitting in meditation enter concentration with a mind that is not scattered is the nun called Sama. Sama has a verse in the Terigata, but uh, when we compare to the Pali list, we would have expected uh, the Buddha's half sister Nanda to be in this place because in the Pali Nanda is the one with uh, the deep concentration attainments. But as I mentioned, Nanda is um, 
kind of like a confused character in the tradition. She is not very clearly defined. And it seems that in the Chinese, she, uh, she wasn't very prominent at all because she doesn't appear at all in this list of 51 nuns. So Nanda just simply, um, yeah, isn't found here. And of those who analyze the meaning widely, meaning and widely teach the development of the path is the nun called Padmaranjana. So Padmaranjana does not appear in the Pali tradition. And of course she has a teaching quality here. So she's one of the teaching nuns. Of those who respectfully uphold the disciplinary rules without infraction is the nun called Patachara. So we see Patachara again with her Vinaya quality. Here her quality is slightly different from the Pali. Um, in the Pali, she was one who had memorized the Vinaya. Here she is one who keeps the rules. So there's a slightly different angle, but in both traditions, she is associated with uh, Vinaya practice. Um, and then of those who have irreversibly attained liberation by faith is the nun called Badakachana. So we see Badakachana again, the one who is associated with uh, Yasodara. Um, but again, uh, her quality is different from the Pali. In the Pali, she had a wisdom quality. Here she has a faith quality. Um, um, so she seems to have had a different character in the Chinese tradition. And of those who have attained the four analytical knowledges, being without timidity in the heart is the nun called Vijaya. Vijaya uh, reappears uh, regularly, both in the Pali and in the Chinese. She has verses in the Terigata. She also appears in the Bhikkhuni Samyutta and the Chinese parallels to the Bhikkhuni Samyutta. And the uh, Pali commentaries uh, explain that she was a friend and a student of Kema. And Kema obviously is the one foremost in wisdom. So it's kind of to be expected that her students also uh, have wisdom qualities. And the four analytical knowledges means that uh, this also is a wisdom quality. So that matches quite well. The Chinese text here matches quite well with the Pali commentarial tradition. Okay, so among my ordained disciples, the foremost of those nuns who recollect their own past life for innumerable eons is the nun called Vata Kapilani, Mahakasapa's wife. Um, so this is the same as in the Pali. Of those who are of upright countenance and thus respected and liked by the people is the nun called Himajata. Himajata does not appear in the Pali and also this quality uh, isn't mentioned anywhere in the Pali. Um, of those who overcome heterodox practitioners and establish them in the right teaching is the nun called Sona. So here we have Sona again. And uh, Sona is the one who in Pali had the 10 children, was kicked out of the house, and then was the one foremost in energy because she made such a huge effort at her very old age to attain arahanship. In the Chinese, as I mentioned, her character is different. She has a sutta preserved in the Ekotara Agama where she um, debates with, six, uh, with the six famous teachers of uh, non-Buddhist uh, religious movements. So during the Buddha's time, of course, there were many um, wandering movements, many Samana movements. And, they and the teachers of those movements uh, were challenged by Sona to a debate and Sona um, overcame them all according to that discourse. And then the Buddha praises her. Um, and again, he says that apart from himself, no one else except for Sona could have done that. Um, so again, he places her even, on, uh, even uh, ahead of the monks um, in this ability to uh, debate and overcome heterodox practitioners. So, so clearly this quality here is um, alluding to that discourse in the Ekotra Agama. Um, so the next one is again Dhammadina, of those who analyze the meaning and widely discourse on divisions and parts of the Dharma is the nun called Dhammadina. So she again has her Dhamma teaching quality. And of those who are not ashamed of wearing rough robes is the nun called Uttara. So Uttara here um, is, 
has the same quality that Kisa Gotami has in the Pali, but because Kisa Gotami in the Chinese text is already assigned to keeping all of the ascetic practices as we have seen before. Uh, the ascetic practice of specifically only just uh, wearing rough robes is assigned to another nun called Uttara. And Uttara also has verses in the Terigata of the Pali tradition. So of those who have calm senses and are always with a unified mind is the nun called Pabba. So this is a Samadhi quality and Pabba doesn't appear in the Pali tradition. Of those who wear the robes in an orderly manner, always according to the instructions of the Dharma is the nun called Genti. Genti has a, a verse in the Terigata. Of those who are able to discuss in various ways without doubt or hesitation is the nun called Dantika. Dantika is also um, mentioned in the Terigata. She has verses there. And again, she has a teaching quality here. Of those who compose stanzas in praise of the virtues of the Tathagata is the nun called Devadinna. So Devadinna does not appear in the Pali, but this quality composing stanzas in praise of the virtues of the Tathagata. So composing stanzas is a quality that is recognized in the Pali. There is a monk called Vangisa who has the same quality associated. And generally uh, throughout many of the early texts, also other um, Chinese texts that belong to different traditions, this uh, quality of being able to compose stanzas, it seems to have been very, very highly valued. And um, Probably that is because the early tradition was an oral tradition and an oral culture. So language wasn't really written down and the ability to play with language and to make it beautiful and to spontaneously um, be able to be creative with language seems to have been very greatly valued um, throughout, throughout all the different uh, Buddhist traditions, uh, probably because of that um, oral culture. Um, and of those who are widely learned and in their kindness reach out even to the most inferior is the nun called Gopi. Among my ordained disciples, the foremost of those nuns who are always in secluded quiet places instead of living among people is the nun called Abaya. So Abaya has verses in the Terigata and we see that she has a kind of ascetic uh, practice attached to her being always in a secluded quiet place. Um, which of course is interesting because um, according to the Vinaya as we have it nowadays, this would be a practice that would be highly difficult or actually not really permitted by the Vinaya. So that is a very interesting tension that we see here between the texts and something we are going to explore in the session about the ascetic practices. Um, of those who beg for arms, even when physically ill, without choosing between rich and poor donors, is the nun called Visaka. Visaka also has a verse in the Terigata. And again, this is a kind of ascetic practice. Of those who sit alone in a single place without moving at all, is the nun called Vatapala. Again, a kind of ascetic practice. Of those who wander everywhere, begging for arms among a range of people, is the nun called Manuhari. So again, some kind of ascetic practice. Mm. Of those who quickly had accomplished the fruits of the path without in the course of that encountering any obstruction is the nun called Dhamma. So her quality is very, very similar to the one of Bhattakundala Kesa. Um, of those who keep to the three main ropes, never being separate from them, is the nun called Sudama. So this again is an ascetic practice. Of those who always sit at the root of a tree with an unmoving mind, is the nun called Lina, an ascetic practice. Of those who always live out in the open without caring for a cover, is the nun called Shatua, yet another ascetic practice. And here um, we see that. Um, this name is obviously a Chinese name. So um, it is very, sometimes very difficult to reconstruct the Indian or Indic name from the Chinese characters. And sometimes um, we can say with high certainty what the name is, 
sometimes we have to guess and sometimes we just have no idea at all and in this case um of, obviously Banta and Alio felt everything was too uncertain and he just left the Chinese name here and we're going to see that later again with another nun of those who delight in empty and secluded places not in being among people is the nun called Upachala again an ascetic practice and Upachala is Sari Buddha's sister. She is well attested in the traditions. Sari Buddha had six siblings, three brothers and three sisters, and all of them attained arahanship. And Upachala has verses in the Terigata, and she's also mentioned in the Bikuni Samyutta and the Chinese parallels to the Bikuni Samyutta. So she does uh, reappear regularly in other texts. Of those who continually sit on a grass mat without even putting a cloth on it is the nun called Vina. So this is another ascetic practice. And of those who wear rag robes and go to beg for arms from houses in the proper order is the nun called Anopama. So another ascetic practice. And Anopama is found in the Pali. She has long verses in the Terigata. Um, she comes from a very rich household. She uh, her father was a treasurer. And um, yeah, it's very interesting the contrast from the very rich household then to uh, going to um, do these very austere um, ascetic practices. And um, for me, these kind of small discoveries are so beautiful because from the party, we get uh, one aspect of her character. And then when we look at the Chinese, it's like another puzzle piece that comes in and we get a more complete um, picture of that nun. So if things fit together very nicely, I always think that is really beautiful. And that's why I also like so much to explore um, the different uh, Buddhist traditions, um, because we just learned so much more about the lives of the early theories. And so Anupama is one of the examples that I found uh, very beautiful. Um, among my ordained disciples, the foremost of those nuns who delight in staying in abandoned cemeteries is the nun called Uttama, so another ascetic practice, and uh, Uttama also has verses in the Terigata. Of those who dwell much in metta, thinking of all forms of life with empathy, is the nun called Chanda. Chanda also has a verse in the Terigata, and here we see something we haven't seen before, a Brahma Vihara practice, uh, namely um, loving kindness, metta practice. Uh, followed by the compassion practice, another Brahma Vihara practice. Uh, of those who have compassion for living beings who have not yet reached the path is the nun called Soma. And Soma, again, is a nun that is um, portrayed very differently in the different traditions. Um, she will reappear again in the other list that we uh, will discuss later. Um, in the Pali tradition, she appears uh, in the Terigata and also in the Bikuni Samyutta and then also in the Chinese parallels. And uh, she is the nun who is challenged by Mara and Mara uh, says to her, well, why do you practice at all? You're a woman, you don't have the wisdom, women can't attain, so it's a complete waste of time um, for you to be practicing. And of course, uh, Soma refutes him and tells him that only people under the sway of Mara think in this way and think in these gender stereotypical ways. And one who has actually seen the path and who has attained uh, awakening uh, knows that gender is entirely irrelevant. So she is one of those um, um, persons, or th these are what, this is one of the texts where we can very clearly see the attitude of the early text towards men and women and, and gender questions. And it's just entirely irrelevant when you practice the path. So that is Soma in the Pali tradition. Um, so in the Pali tradition, she is not mentioned on the list of foremost nuns, but she's very clearly present and very popular. Um, and here um, she does a compassion practice. Um, so, um, yeah, it's, it, doesn't, it, it doesn't connect really with the Pali, but of course it's possible that she um, does, co does compassion practice and also talks to Mara, so it's not contradictory either, but it's also not, not um, very similar. 
Um, of those who delight in the attainment of the path with the aspiration to reach it wholly is the nun called Matali. So she seems to be someone who is still on the path, who hasn't reached Arahanship yet. Of those who are restrained in all activities and whose mind does not stray far away is the nun called Kalaka. So she seems to be doing some mindfulness in daily life practice. Of those who keep to emptiness and hold on to vacuity, understanding that there is nothing substantial in the world, is the nun called Deva Sutta. So she is doing a kind of samadhi practice that is called Sunyata Samadhi. Of those whose heart delights in signlessness and in discarding all attachments, is the nun called Surya Pabba. So she's doing Animita Samadhi, which is also a very profound Samadhi practice. Of those who cultivate wishlessness with their mind always willing to help others widely is the nun called Manapa. Of those who are free from doubt in regard to all teachings and who deliver people without limit, limits is the nun called Vimada. Of those who are able to explain widely and analyze the meaning of profound teachings is the nun called Samantapabhasa. So these last two are, are again teaching nuns. Um, they don't appear in the Pali. So among my ordained disciples, the foremost of those nuns who cherish patience in the heart, being just like the earth, which tolerates anything, is the nun called Dhammadi. Um, so this nun is doing a four elements practice, specifically earth element practice. And she's also practicing Kanti, patience. So these are also um, practices we haven't seen so far. Of those who are able to teach and transform people, inducing them to make gifts to the monastic community of utensils, beds, and seeds, is the nun called Suyama. So this is an interesting point uh, because in the Chinese original text, Suyama is actually um, assigned two different qualities. And um, Banta Analyo then chooses to um, put those two together into one quality because he thinks or he, he left a note there says it really doesn't make much sense to him the way the text is uh, written in Chinese. But actually, I think it's, um, I, I had a look at the text and I think it's, um, <coughs> it does make a lot of sense to keep it separate. Sorry. Mm. And um, <coughs> I'm having a very dry mouth today. Sorry about the, all the coughing. Um, so in the Pali tradition for the monks, we see that very regularly that a monk is assigned several different qualities. For example, Ananda is assigned five different qualities and other monks are assigned like two or three different qualities. So it's not at all unusual that a nun would be assigned two qualities. And I think the text very clearly presents it as two separate things. So um, one quality is those uh, foremost of those who are able to teach and transform people, inducing them to make gifts to the Sangha. And the other one is uh, preparing beds and seeds. And uh, I think it makes a lot of sense to keep that separate because we know the early Sangha was a wandering Sangha. So many people came and went um in and out of uh monasteries all the time and we have um, obligations in the vineyard how to look after visitors and how to look after newcomers um so preparing stuff for them and looking after them and making sure they uh, have everything and know everything that they need to know um and we have similar qualities in the pali for the monks so it kind of does make sense that a nun would be assigned a similar quality for nuns communities. So I think that Tsuyama is actually some kind of guest nun. Uh, and it, it does make sense to keep those two qualities separate in, in my opinion. Anyway, I, I, I thought it was very beautiful that, to see that there was a guest nun because that is something that we still have nowadays in our communities. And I feel there's some kind of connection and some kind of continuity there. Um, of those who have a mind that is always calm and does not, does not generate agitated perceptions is the nun called Indaja. So she has a Samadhi practice. Of those who never tire of contemplating the Dharma with understanding is the nun called Nagi. 
So she has a Vipassana practice of those who have a strong and courageous mind and are not polluted by attachments is the nun called Kunala. So I love that quality very much because it's usually, I mean, being strong and courageous is usually, are usually qualities that are kind of ascribed to men rather than to women. So um, seeing uh, that the diversity of practice in the nun Sangha and seeing that these kind of uh, practices were, these kind of qualities were also ascribed to nuns uh, is what I think, what I thought was uh, very inspiring. Um, of those who enter concentration on water, turning everything into moisture is the nun called Vasu. And of those who enter concentration on fire, fully illuminating anything is the nun called Chandi. So here again, we, we see four element practices. Just now we saw earth, now we see water and fire. And of those who contemplate impurity and analyze dependent arising is the nun called Chapa. So this is again a Vipassana quality. Impurity is a Subha and of course a dependent origination I think is uh, clear. And Chapa is so fascinating. I was so happy to see her on this list uh, when, I, when I read the list for the first time because Chapa has verses in the Terigata and in the Terigata she's a very different person. She's not a nun. She's not even Buddhist. She is uh, just um, a married woman and her husband uh, wants to go forth as a monk and she does everything she can to obstruct him from going forth. And she even threatens to kill their only son uh, to make him stay, but it doesn't work. And he goes forth anyway, and he becomes fully enlightened. And that's where the Terigata verse ends. And so we don't know what happens to Chapa. Only in the commentary, we hear that later she also went forth and um, got fully enlightened. Um, and then we encounter her again here in this Chinese text and we see that she did actually go forth and she even became a foremost nun. Uh, so a complete uh, turnaround of her character from being very hostile towards Buddhism to being one of the foremost nuns. And I thought that was, uh, Again, a puzzle piece coming together and, and just completing a story that we cannot uh, completely see if we only look at one tradition of Buddhism. So, and the foremost of those who support people, giving them what is lacking is the nun called Sukha. And Sukha is found in the Pali tradition and she has verses in the Terigata and she's also mentioned in two discourses in the Samyutta Nikaya. And she is highly, highly praised for her teaching abilities. Um, but again, um, she reappears in different traditions. She also re reappears in various Apadana stories. So it seems that she was very popular in later tradition. People were very interested in her Apadanas, in her life stories. And she is a nun that is, again, um, her, uh, her character is, again, kind of different in the different traditions. So in the Pali, she's a highly revered teacher. And here in this, in this particular Chinese text, uh, she seems to be doing um, socially engaged Buddhist practice or charity work or something. So un unless giving people what is lacking refers to Dhamma teaching, uh, it seems to be a fairly different uh, personality that is described here compared to the Pali. And the last one among my ordained disciples, who attain final realization, the foremost of those nuns is the nun called Vata Kundala Kesa. So she has the same quality as in Pali. And just want to mention, if somebody looks at the original Chinese text, you will see that um, the text is actually corrupted. Her quality is missing. So the original text only says that she is the last of the foremost nuns, but doesn't mention her quality. So Bhante Analayo has restored that from a discourse quotation. So this list is quoted, quoted in another discourse where her quality is mentioned. So that's how um, Bhante Anala, you inserted it here. And if you look at the original, um, now you know why there is this um, discrepancy. Uh, and I know I'm going over time, so I'm uh, going to be more quick, but I do want to go through um, this last one as well. This is the individual discourse. Um, and this one is really interesting 
because this list is uh, not an early Buddhist text. It seems to be slightly later than the other two lists, and it does have some unique features. So I really want to go through it uh, quickly, um, as quickly as possible. So among my Bikunidis, the great Bikuni disciple who has left behind a royal family has long gone forth with pure conduct and always keeping celibacy is Mahapachapati Gotami, Mahapachapati Bikuni. So we see Mahapachapati again in as the, the first nun mentioned, and we can immediately see that uh, this list is later because it is mentioned that she went forth from a royal family, and the idea that the Buddha's family was royal is stems from a later um, historical period in the early Buddhist text. The Buddha was not a prince. Uh, Sudodana, his father, was not a king. Mahapachapati was not a queen. Uh, Sakya was, uh, the Sakyans were not a kingdom. Sakyans were a republic. They were governed by a council of the male heads of the families. So uh, the idea that uh, Sudodana was a king and uh, that, that is a later idea. And so because now here it is said she went forth from a royal family that immediately tells us that this list is somewhat later. Um, so now we expect Kema and Upalavana, but uh, no. The next one is Patachara. And here she is described as one who is of few wishes, who knows moderation and who follows the ascetic practices. So this is unexpected. Patachara is usually associated with the Vinaya. We have seen that in the other two lists. Um, so here, Patachara seems to have swapped places with Kisa Gotami, who is usually the one doing ascetic practices. And now we see Kema and Upalavana with the usual qualities of wisdom and uh, unsurpassed psychic powers. Um, now, um, the one who undertakes what should be practiced and easily attains the divine eye is Soma. We would have expected Sakula here. Um, in the Chinese and in the Pali, Sakula is the one with the divine eye, but we see Soma. And as I mentioned, Soma is very, very different in the different um, traditions. We are going to see her again, so I'm not going to recap. I'm going to recap later. Um, the one who contemplates what she has heard and has accumulated vast knowledge is Supa Kamaradita Bikuni. So we haven't seen Supa Kamaradita so far. Uh, but she appears in the Pali as well as in various Chinese vineyards. Um, she has a very long verse in the Terigata. She is Suba, the goldsmith's daughter. And um, yeah, she also reappears in the Vinaya um, where she is Upalavana's student. And yeah, it seems that she was quite popular in various Buddhist traditions. Um, the one who is able to keep the Vinaya rules without fail is Kisa Gotami Bikuni. So as I mentioned, she has swapped places with Patachara and is here in this list. She is the one who is keeping Vinaya. Um, the one who is skilled at proclaiming the marvelous Dhamma is Dhammadina Bikuni. So Dhammadina always has the same quality. And I think that's also partially to do with her name. Because when you're called Dhammadina, then there's the immediate association with uh, teaching Dhamma. So that's why I think all the traditions have preserved her quality in the same way. And uh, of those who always propagate the uh, marvelous Dhamma out of compassion is the Bhikkhuni Dhamma, the Sakyan daughter. So there is a Dhamma in the Terigata also, might be the same person. And of those who intensively engage in noble deeds and is a light among the families is Maha Sukha Bhikkhuni. So here we see Sukha again. And as I mentioned in the Pali tradition, she is a great teacher. Um, in the Chinese discourse that we've, the Chinese list we have seen just now, she was the one who gives families what is lacking. So she seemed to be, to do some kind of socially engaged Buddhism. And here her quality is very similar because she intensively engages in noble deeds and is a light among families. So it also seems that she is um, doing merit making activities or maybe um, helping families and so on. Um, so that, that is uh, Sukha. 
And the one who seeking great fruit went forth out of faith is the Bikuni, mother of Sigalaka, the householder. So Sigalaka Mata, we have seen her in the party with exactly the same quality. And uh, those who did good deeds in previous lives and are now endowed with great merit, the foremost is Rahula Mata Yasoda da Bikuni. So finally, we see Yasoda da somewhere. And as I mentioned, Yasoda da doesn't appear in any of the early texts. So this is again an indication that li this list is uh, a later list. Um, and we also see, as I mentioned, Yasodara's character uh, isn't um, well defined in the Pali. Um, but uh, Kachana um, has the has a quality that is linked to wisdom. In the first Chinese list, she has a quality that is linked to faith. And now she has a quality of uh, merit making. So um, yeah, it's just, it just seems uh, very different. And then of those who practice persistently and have great energy, the foremost is Jatila Bikuni. Jatila we haven't seen so far, but she does appear in the Pali one single time in a tiny paragraph where she and Ananda meet when they're both alone in the forest. And they discuss a very profound uh, meditation attainment. And Jatila also appears in a um, origin story in the Sarva Sivada Bikuni Vinaya, where she is highly learned and she asks a profound Abhidhamma question of a monk, and the monk can't answer and he's very embarrassed. And then the Buddha lays down a rule that nuns are not allowed to ask monks questions unless the monks have previously allowed it to prevent monks from being embarrassed by the more highly learned bhikkhunis. Um, so Jatila um, does appear elsewhere. She's always uh, highly praised. Um, and here she has a quality of being persistent and having great energy, which is not something that we see in other traditions. Um, but yeah, it's interesting. She is such a marginal figure that her character um, probably wasn't well defined um, in the early traditions. So one of those who can swiftly attain her goal is Bada Kundala Kesa Bikuni. She has the same quality in all traditions. And of those who have profound wisdom and understand the suttas and the Vinaya well, the foremost is Nyo Jing Bikuni. So she's again one where we cannot reconstruct um, the, in, the Indic name. So these are the lists. Um, I know I've gone over time. I hope you enjoyed them. And um, as promised, there's also the Apadana literature and I'll make it very, very brief. Um, there are four nuns mentioned in the Apadana Sataka, which is a Sanskrit text, somewhat later text. And Apadana Sataka, Avadana Sataka means uh, 100 texts, 100 Apadana texts. And of those 100 stories, there are 10 stories about nuns. And of those 10 stories, four of them assign nuns, assign foremost qualities to nuns. Uh, so story number 72 assigns um, foremost among those making merit to Supia Bikuni. And Supia does appear in the Pali and she does make a lot of merit, but she is a lay woman. So maybe there is a connection here. Who knows? But it, it is very similar to the person described in the Pali. Um, story 74 is again Soma. And this is the fourth time we see Soma and the fourth time that she is described very differently. So in the Pali, she was the one who challenged Mara's ideas of gender. In the first Chinese list, she was the one who was foremost in compassion. In the second Chinese list, she was the one who had the divine eye. And now here she is foremost among those who have heard much and among those who remember what they have heard. So clearly uh, her character varies widely in the different traditions. Then we have Kajangala. Kajangala is very interesting because she is one of the very, very few nuns who have a discourse, an entire discourse preserved in the Pali tradition and where the Buddha praises her very much and says, if he had given the discourse, he would have given it exactly in the same way as Kajangala Bikuni. Um, 
So she does exist in the Pali. And here in this Apadana, she has a very interesting story. She, um, she was the Buddha's mother in 500 past lives. And she was supposed to be his mother also in the last life um, when he becomes a Buddha instead of Maya. But uh, then she uh, committed some kind of misdeed and lost the merit. And then uh, Maya was instead the one who gave birth to the Buddha in the last life. And similar to the Pali, I mean, similar to the Pali discourse, uh, she is very good at explaining suttas. So her character, this quality aligns very well with the Pali tradition as well. And then of course, Kema again, foremost among those with great wisdom among, and among those with great eloquence. So that is very similar across all traditions. And then there's another text, the Karma Sataka, which is only, which is also an Apadana text, only preserved in Tibetan, uh, originally translated obviously from an Indic language, but the Indic original has not survived. And I cannot read Tibetan, but very fortunately, there is a French translation, 120 years old. And if you search a lot, you can find it on the internet. And in uh, that Karma Sataka, there are many stories of nuns. Um, but only one nun is assigned a foremost quality, and that is in the story number 20, there is Kesavati. This is a nun we haven't seen so far. She was the hairdresser of Maya. And when Mahapajapati went forth together with her 500 women, she was one of those women. And she was foremost among those who undertake heroism. So that's a very interesting quality, one we haven't seen so far. Again, one that is kind of male gendered. Um, but yeah, here it is assigned to this hairdresser. And uh, yeah, I was just uh, very happy to discover this one last nun in uh, this Karma Sataka text. And I just wanted to share that with you. And um, this is the end of the um, foremost nuns that I wanted to share with you. I'm not going to go into the... Um, Khmer list now. If you want to see the Khmer list, you can ask a question, but uh, I have already gone a lot over time. So um, yeah, I want to uh, leave time for questions now. And um, yeah, if you want to see the Khmer list, please ask and otherwise ask all the other questions that you have. Just going to check if anybody has left a question in the live chat but I don't see any question. Does anybody have a question? Venerable, I, hi, sorry. Yeah, I, hi. yeah, just a very quick question. Could you repeat the numbering of the Chinese um, Agama where we could find um, the text? Yes, you just... so that individual discourse that is not found in a collection is T126. And the other list, the long list with the 50 nuns was in the Ekotara Agama. And that is 5.1 to 5.5. Thank you. Yeah, Esther? Could, you, could you tell us where to find the encounter of the venerable uh, Chatila and Ananda in the Pali uh, canon? Where is it? Um, yes, I can tell you, but I have to look it up. Let's see if I have that here. Oh. Ah, yes, that is Angotra Nikaya 9.37. And you have to look through the entire sutta because the sutta is a little bit long. I think it's uh, there is like if you have Bhikkhu Bodhi's um, version, there is a number nine there somewhere in the text, and is this like ninth, um, ninth paragraph or whatever that, that nine stands for, and, and it should be there or somewhere around there.
Um, thank you so much for this. I really appreciate it. Um, I, this is the first time I've heard that um, that Sakya was a republic. Um, can you say a little bit more about that? Um, yes. So uh, in the in the Buddha's time, what we see in the early discourses is that there were like in the central Ganges plain where the Buddha was teaching, uh, there were um, very small countries. Uh, usually they're called the 16 Mahajanapada or the 16 great countries. But by modern standards, we wouldn't really call them great countries. They're fairly small countries. And some of them were kingdoms. So for example, the kingdom of Kosala and the kingdom of Magadha. And some of them were republics. For example, the Vajji Republic and also the Sakyan Republic. Um, so it's quite well attested. Like there, there are discourses where the Buddha goes to, to uh, returns to, to, um, to um, the Sakyan country and where they describe how they build a new assembly hall, where they always assemble and where they carry out their business. Um, so um, it, it is fairly clear that there was no uh, king in Sakya uh, from, from the circumstances, how the discourses are portrayed um, and the environment that we see, it is fairly clear that um, Sakya was a republic at the time, such as other, I mean, it wasn't the only republic, there were other smaller countries such as the Vajians who were also republics at that time. So that wasn't an unusual government model at the time. But in the years after um, the Buddha's passing, the years and decades after the passing, um, the bigger kingdoms slowly took over all the um, smaller republics uh, until um, this entire area was united under the Magadan kingdom. Um, a few decades or maybe a century after the Buddha, or maybe one or two centuries after the Buddha's passing. Thank you. <laughs> oh, I see uh, Dana has left a question in the chat. I feel puzzled about the rule for nuns in one of the party mokas not to ask monks questions. Is that among the Theravada rules for nuns as well? Yes, that rule is found in almost all of the, I don't know if I should say all or almost all. I know it's found in many. Um, I could look it up and see if it's in all, but let's just say it's in, in most of the um, Patimokas of most of the schools. Um, and usually the origin stories always say that the nuns were highly learned and that the monks were embarrassed. Um, so, yeah. Um, as I mentioned last time, the origin stories are from a significantly later time. Uh, they don't go back to the Buddha. So at that time, as I mentioned last time, uh, gender relations weren't equal anymore. Um, so being challenged by a woman would have been very difficult for the man at that time. And um, probably that is why the origin stories were written in the way they were written. And I, I mean, even nowadays, I, I know so many nuns who had um, encounters with monks and the monks then um, were embarrassed and just pointed out the rule to them and said, well, you shouldn't have asked me in the first place. Um, so that's still very common until nowadays. Okay, so I think if there are no further questions, we can finish up for today. Um, next time we are going to talk about Mahapajapati. So I hope you're all looking forward to that. Um, and we will finish as usual with uh, three sadhus. So if you want, you can join me. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. And see you all next time.